Welcome back to our study of 2 Timothy. We're on the home stretch. We're almost finished. Paul has written a second, very personal, very intimate letter to his friend and protege, Timothy. At the time of his writing, Paul is in a Roman prison. He's awaiting his death. He, he doesn't know when it's going to happen. He just knows that it is going to happen. And one of the things that he wants to do before he dies is to sit down and write one more letter to his closest friend, Timothy. It's filled with advice. It's filled with encouragement. And when we last left off our previous lesson, it was filled with some very strong words, some very strong warnings about what was going to happen. I mean, he was aware of the problems in the churches in Ephesus already. There was false teaching. There was chaos in their worship services. But he took the time in chapter 3 to begin to say, Timothy, in the last days before Jesus Christ returns, the problems in the church are going to be even greater. You need to be aware of these things. You need to address these things. And so when we return to 2 Timothy chapter 3 today, we pick up the very strong encouragement of Timothy, of Paul to Timothy, to address these problems. So let me begin with a statement like this. In, in our culture, in English, we have a short phrase that goes like this. To be forewarned is to be forearmed. To be forewarned is to be forearmed. Essentially, what that statement means is, if you know danger is coming, you can prepare for it. For example, in winter, when our roads are icy and your roads are icy, before our daughter drives to school in the car, we say, Michaela, please be careful. The roads are icy this morning. Please drive slowly. Please drive cautiously. That's an example of to be forewarned is to be forearmed. What it's saying is, if you know danger is coming, you can be ready for it. You don't have to be surprised by it. And that becomes an encouragement as well as a warning. So what Paul is doing to Timothy is he is forewarning him so that he can be forearmed, so that he can be ready. And when we left off last time, we had finished a list of 18 or 20 different warnings about problems that would be not in the world, but inside the church. And rather than going through that entire list and just saying, this is what this means, this is what this means, which would have been an interesting study, we said, what you need to know is what the first bookend is like and what the last bookend is like. So let's go back. Before I read the passage that we're going to look at, which will be 2 Timothy 3, verses 5 through 9, I want you just to see the two bookends. The first bookend to these problems occurs in verse 2, and the second one occurs in verse 4. Bookend number 1 said this, For people will be lovers of self. They'll be self-centered. Inside our churches, people will be self-centered. And then he goes on with this long list, but everything in the list describes being self-centered. The second bookend occurred in verse 4 when he said at the end of that verse, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. That also is self-centered. We want to enjoy this. We want to do this instead of loving God. It replaced their love for God with a love for pleasure and the things of this world and the type of things. So bookend number one, lovers of self. Bookend numbers of two, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And everything in between that, Timothy, you need to be warned that this is in your church. So what we're going to do today is uh, repeat verse 5 and then continue on to verse 9. And it becomes a very descriptive example of what happens when these dangers come into the church. I put it under the heading that we've been saying throughout 2 Timothy of navigation that we are, as individuals and like churches, navigating through waters of life. Sometimes we navigate towards something that's good and right and the waters are safe. And sometimes we navigate away from things, like navigating away from icebergs or navigating away from large rocks that have cropped up like islands. In today's case, I'm going to state it positively. I want to say that we're navigating toward truth toward truth. We live in a culture in which truth is being redefined. Does anyone really know what truth is? 
It's not a new argument. It's not a new question. They've been asking that question since time began. But in our era, it seems to be even an amplification of that same problem. Well, it may be true to you, but it's not true to you, and maybe it's true in part to me. Paul is going to tell to Timothy how he can evaluate what truth is as he navigates these waters. So let's read verses 5 through 9 of 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5 through verse 9. This is what he writes. Having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. That's the conclusion of his sentence. Here's his next sentence. Avoid such people. Verse 6, for among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins, led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. But they will not get very far. For their folly will be plain to all, as was that of these two men. I'm going to give you a single word for the different sections in this particular piece of verses. And the way I would come back and label verse 5 would be the word counterfeit. Counterfeit. It's a fake. It's a fraud. It looks like the real thing, but it's not. For example, in, in America, we have a dollar bill. So let, let's imagine that I have a $100 bill. In Russia, let's say you have a, a thousand ruble bill. You look at it very carefully and you examine it and you say, it looks real to me. But you take it to an expert who knows what these bills should look like and he gets out his magnifying glass and he holds it under certain lights and under this light and he says, this is not a real bill. This is a fake. This is a counterfeit. This is not right. And so it is not worth the amount of money that it says it is. What Paul is saying in this first verse, in, five, in, in verse 5 here, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, that's counterfeit. It's not real. It looks good on the outside, but internally it's not. For those of you who like to go shopping, as I said, I don't really like to go shopping, but I observe people. But if you ever walk by a store, in a storefront, and you see a mannequin, so you see a, a, a not real object dressed up with the clothes that that particular store is trying to sell. It might be a woman, and it's in this beautiful dress. It might be a man, and it's in this very handsome suit. But the mannequin is not real. The suit is for sale, and I could buy it, and I could wear it myself. But the, the, the image underneath is not real. That's another example of what he's saying. It looks good. It appears to be godly, but it's not. It's just a counterfeit. You say, well, what are you talking about? What does that look like in terms of church? Let me give you an example. Because I go to church early before my family comes, we don't often drive to church together. But once in a while we do, when I'm not preaching or when we're just visiting. So we leave our home, we get in the car, and on our way to the church, all of a sudden our children start fighting. And one person says this to the other, and then they're upset, and then they start arguing. And all the way to church, this argument is going back and forth, and I'm getting frustrated, and I'm getting angry. I get, be quiet back there. Why can't you get along with your sister? And so I'm, I'm arguing with that. So we get to church, and we get out of the vehicle, and we walk up to the front door, and someone says, good morning, how are you? And I say, I'm fine. That's being counterfeit. Because inside, my heart is in turmoil. My mind is upset. I want to I want to punish our children. But when I walk into that church, I say, I'm fine. I'm having a great day. Thank you. Paul says the problem in our churches, as the last days come, nearing the return of Jesus Christ, people are going to have an appearance of godliness, but they'll deny its power. If the power of the Holy Spirit, if the power of the Word of God was in their lives, we would not be hypocrites. We would not be counterfeits. I'm not saying that we're going to be perfect. Don't misunderstand me. He's not saying that in this life you can have a perfection. That's what sanctification is. We are progressively becoming more like Jesus Christ so that less and less we become counterfeits. One author wrote it this way. He said this, 
true spirituality issues from right thinking in concert with God's power within the spirit of a person which transforms outward behavior. True Christianity cannot be hidden, nor is it a private religion without public effect. Let me give you part of that again. True spirituality issues from right thinking in concert with God's power within the spirit of a person which transforms their outward behavior. I sometimes say to our people that your Christianity may be personal, but it is never completely private. See, in America, they're trying to convince us that your, your spirituality, your religion, is just something that's a private matter. You don't need to share that with other people. I say, that's not what Jesus Christ commanded us to do. He told us to go and make disciples. He told us to teach them. He told us to baptize them. He told us to tell them, tells us to teach them how to obey. I like that word concert when that person used it in this description. It reminds me of sweet music. I told you that our daughter plays the violin, and so three or four times a year she plays in a concert in an orchestra with other instruments. And, and when they get ready to begin their concert, before the concert master comes out, someone tunes their instruments. Well, they don't just sit there and tune it based on what they hear. Someone will play a note on a piano. Or maybe the first violinist will play the note on his violin. Everyone tunes their notes to his or her violin. But there is one person who holds the standard by which everyone tunes their instruments. So that notion of concert is that there's a harmony, there's a unity, there's still a diversity, there are different instruments in the orchestra, but that there is a unity of sound and purpose and passion and Paul says, Timothy, that's what you want in your church. But I want you to be ready to be forewarned is to be forearmed that in the last days, there's going to be a form of godliness, but they're going to deny its power. They won't understand the power of Jesus Christ and his word. They won't understand the power of the Holy Spirit in them. And he says very simply, he says, avoid such people. Stay away from them. Timothy, if that's the way they want to live their lives, you don't need to invest a huge amount of time in them. You need to invest your time in people who are pursuing the things of God and of Jesus Christ. One person said a statement that has stuck with me that I like very much because sometimes we say, I don't know if my life has changed. For example, I've been a Christian for most of my life. The number of years that I've been a believer, I, I don't know how much I'm changing from one year to the other. But one, one pastor said this, you know you've met God when you see change in your life. You know you've met God when you see change in your life. If you look back at my life over the number of years that I've been a Christian, I may not be able to see change from one week to the next or one day to the next. But when I look back over the last year, when I look back over the last 10 years, when I look back over the last 40 years, I say, I've changed a lot. God has grown me. God has matured me. He has changed me. He has given me some enormous difficulties and challenges, but in my weakness, he showed himself to be strong. One of the problems that we have in any culture is that sometimes we reduce a faith in Jesus Christ to a simple decision or a simple prayer or in some faith even a simple baptism. The gospel of Jesus Christ was never intended just to be one small decision or one small baptism. It was intended to be life change. It was intended to transform. That one of the difficulties that we're having in America right now is challenging people to say, you have become a Christian, you profess faith in Jesus Christ, Let's go to the next level. Let's learn. Let's engage. Let's connect with other people. Let's serve. And then watch what happens to your faith. Let's watch what happens to your maturity. We invite you to participate in the International Bible Teaching and Gospel Sharing Project. Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities will become available to people around the world depends on all of us. We very much need and value your prayer and financial support. For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. 
So we ask ourselves a question something like this. Are we engaged in a form of outward worship or are we engaged in something that changes us from the inside out? That's what transformation is. It is a change on the inside that is reflected on the outside. And that's what Paul is warning Timothy about. Timothy, watch out. They have an appearance of godliness. They deny its power. Avoid those people. Stay away from those people. They're just going to sap your strength. They're going to sap your time. And you must work with those who are dedicated to serving Jesus Christ and growing to become like him. He says in verse 6, For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins, and led astray by various passions, always learning, never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. That takes us to our second one. I use the word conniving or scheming. That people who are not centered on the gospel of Jesus Christ, that are not dedicated with a passion to serve the Lord with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, they will come up with devices and schemes to take advantage of people and steer them off in directions that are not God-honoring. When I read that verse and it says, there, for among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, a lot of people in our culture would say, what do you mean weak women? Are you calling all women weak? Women are not weak. By, the Bible doesn't like women. It reinforces my notion that God doesn't like women. And see, it says it right here. I say, um, hold on a minute. Whenever you see a phrase like that, don't react to how it makes you feel immediately. You say, what was going on in the culture at that time? He's not saying that all of you women here today and listening to this or watching this are weak. He's not. God loves women. What is he talking about when he refers to them as being weak and that they're led astray and they're burdened with sins? Let's go back into the first century culture. First of all, the word weak literally means little or diminutive, small or small-minded. When he says that they were weak, he's not talking about their physical strength. He's not talking about women as a gender. He says there's a particular group of women who were small-minded. Again, in the first century, if you recall, women were often not educated. Things were beginning to change, and some education was beginning to happen. But basically, compared to the men, if the men are up here, the women are down here in terms of society, in terms of education, in terms of opportunity, in terms of income and earning. They're way down here. So all of a sudden, Christianity comes along, and women and men are equated in the eyes of God. No longer is this social dysfunction. But men and women are brought equal into the presence of God, and now they're allowed to worship, they're allowed to learn, they're allowed to understand the scriptures. But some of these women who were, who were uh, new to Christianity, all of a sudden they're hearing all of these different false teachers in addition to Timothy, in addition to the teaching of the scriptures, and they're saying, well, this sounds good, and this sounds good, and that sounds good. I'm not sure which one is right. In addition, they were very vulnerable when it says that they were burdened with sins and led astray by various passions. Maybe things had happened to them. Maybe they had committed their own variety of sins. And so they have this internal guilt well, I'm not worth anything. I'm not good for it. My husband treats me poorly, and I deserve it. I'm not smart. I, I failed. Our marriage fell apart because of me. And so they have this heap of guilt upon them. And then this teacher comes into town, and they listen, and it gives them a bit of hope, but they're not able to understand how it compares to the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden, they go off on this trail. And then the next teacher comes on, and they go off on this trail. So what you have is these teachers who are deceptive. And when they would come into these towns, they would be needing a place to stay. And so they would look for someone with whom they could stay. And in the Roman culture and in the first century culture, you really couldn't associate with a married woman. So you would look for people who you would have an opportunity to latch onto and stay with and you would take advantage of them if you were one of these false teachers. It was a despicable situation. Paul says to Timothy, 
you need to watch out and you need to warn your people because there are going to be teachers who are schemers and who are connivers, and they're going to look for the weakest among you. In fact, these women, according to verse 7, they're always learning but never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. They learn from this teacher. They say, oh, that was very good. This teacher comes. Oh, we learned from that teacher. It was very good. This teacher comes. Oh, we learned from that teacher. That was very good. But I don't know what the truth is. In the culture in which we live now, there are so many opportunities to listen to preachers and teachers on television, on the radio, on the internet, downloading on podcasts. If you wanted to, 24 hours a day, you could listen to a variety of preachers and teachers all day long. But do we have the discernment to know which of them are speaking the truth? I challenge our people from time to time. I say, listen, you challenge me. If I'm not preaching in the word of God, you need to push back. You need to say, Pastor Bruce, I think that what you taught on that particular day was not right. I say, okay, let's look at the scriptures. Did I get it wrong? But the people in this church who were being connived and schemed, they didn't have the understanding to be able to figure out what was really true. A friend of mine tells me a phrase uh, every few months or so just to remind me to keep my perspective. And he says it this way, Bruce, if you always do what you always did, you always get what you always got. I don't know if that works in Russian, but in English, it, it, it's a great statement. If you always do the same thing, but you think you're going to get different results, why would you do that? If you always do what you always did, you're always going to get what you've always gotten before. That these people who pursued the false prophets and the false teachers, they were looking for the particular flavor of the month. It's like going to Baskin Robbins ice cream with its 31 different flavors of ice cream. Well, today I'm going to try strawberry, and tomorrow I'm going to have peach, and tomorrow I'm going to have chocolate, and whatever that was, they just chose the flavor of the month. And so we in our churches, even today, with all of the variety of teachings available around the world, we need to be people of discernment to say, what is the truth? Compare that truth to the word of God. Always learning, but never able to arrive at a knowledge or a comprehension or an understanding of the truth. Again, I go back to that phrase. You know you've met God when you see change in your life. The women who are being affected by these teachers were not seeing change in their life. It's incumbent upon those of us who are teachers to always preach the truth, to always preach the word. As I said to you the other day, I said, if there's one thing that gives me terror in coming here to teach you is, Lord, am I teaching the truth? Are my illustrations right? Are my applications right? Is my development of the understanding of the scriptures accurate? Lord, show me if I'm not right, because I want to teach your truth. So again, under this section of conniving or scheming, he is not putting down women. He is saying, Timothy, be careful, because there's a certain group of people in your church who happen to be women who aren't able to discern what the truth is, and these people will take advantage of it. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.